there. We're going to start today by just looking at our own bodies. Look at the human body, look at your body in particular. We live on land, but how are we specially designed or adapted for this lifestyle? Now there's a few easy things. We have a spine that helps keep us upright. We have legs that hold us up high so we can see. We have eyes that enable us to vision things. We have feet that hold us level to keep us from falling over as we just stand there. Now, in the last couple weeks, we've been looking at a different animal. We've been looking at fish who live underwater. And today we're gonna look at their bodies and look at what special adaptations they have that allow them to survive and avoid predation and thrive and grow in that great environment. I'm Ethan Rotman. I coordinate the Classroom Aquarium Education Program for the California Department of Fish and Bay here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, two weeks ago, you may remember that we looked at fish eggs as they were put into a special tank. And then last week we looked and they had hatched out and they were alevin, which are just tiny little fish with a big yolk sac attached to their belly. We're gonna go back to that tank. We're gonna have tank time with Tom and see what's happening in that tank, how those fish have developed. After that, we're gonna shoot over the bay to the aquarium of the bay in San Francisco. They have huge fish tanks and subsequently bigger fish. And we'll look at some larger fish and their bodies. And then of course, we're gonna meet with a fisheries biologist who's gonna answer some questions that have been sent in by students like you. We're getting a lot of questions mailed to us and please email us some more. So with that, I wanna bring you back to Tom Greer He's an engineer, he's a conservationist, he's an avid fly fisherman, and he's up with a tank of fish. Are you ready for us, Tom? I'm ready for you, Ethan, and thanks for the introduction. Welcome to Tank Time with Tom, everyone. Remember last week, we all showed you how our eggs hatched into Alvin? Did anybody take a guess as to how many eggs we had? Well, there were 58 eggs total, or at least that's what I counted. So. If anybody counted any different, let me know. But we've got 58 alevin in there. And in the wild, the mother steelhead could lay up to 2,000 eggs in what's called a red, which is a little pocket in the gravel, okay? And right now, the, the alvin are just pretty much hanging out in the gravel. And they have some special adaptations, as Ethan was talking about, their special body parts that let them adapt to the life in the wild. And today we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, just so you know, our alvin are alive and thriving, and they're doing great. Um, they are hiding, so there's not a whole lot to see. There's not 58 little alvin swimming around. They're all hiding under rocks. So uh, let's take a look, and, uh, and we'll get into it. So here we are at the tank, and it's about 53 degrees. And you don't see a whole lot of activity. And why is that? Because these little guys, these little alvin, they're huddled towards the bottom of the tank. They're, they're hiding. There's a lot of them in the rocks, behind the rocks and little nooks and crannies. Every once in a while, you can see a little tail poking out there. There's one right in the center of the screen. And there's a few underneath those rocks, kind of hard to see. There's a tail poking out there. But a lot of the activity we've been focusing the camera on this week is this lower right side of the uh, tank. So I'm gonna hang out there for just a second so we can take a closer look at those. Now they're starting to look a little bit more like fry. Notice the egg sac is getting smaller. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about that, okay? We don't have any predators in the tank but someday they'll be big enough to compete with larger fish, but they still have to hide from predators in order to survive in the wild. So they have these special body parts or adaptations that allow them to survive in the wild. Okay, for one, the most obvious is the mouth. Okay, we, we all have mouths, our dogs have mouths, the fish have mouths. But for now, at this stage in the alevin development, the mouth is used to move water through the gills to help absorb oxygen. Okay, they get their food by absorbing nutrients from their yolk sac. It's kind of like a storage tank or belly pack full of food. But once that yolk sac is completely absorbed, they'll be on the hunt for food and will be eating bugs and plants through their mouth. Now, the other thing that'll happen in a week or two 
as they absorb that yolk sac, the uh, fish have what's called an air sac, and they'll use their mouth to gulp air as they swim to the top of the tank. And that air sac will fill up with air and allow them to swim through the water column without using too much energy. And when they want to go down, they burp out the air and, and they go down to the bottom of the tank. That's something that's pretty interesting. Um, there's also eyes. It's pretty obvious. If you can zoom in there, this guy you can see, they've got eyes, which help them see light and look out for predators. And once they've buttoned up or, or absorbed that yolk sac, they'll swim upwards and head toward the light. And they'll start swimming around and looking for food and exploring other hiding places a little bit more. Their color helps them a lot. In fact, some of these rocks are the same color as the fish, so they're camouflaged. And they're hiding from other fish and, and birds and other, other prey or other predators that are on the hunt for these little guys. Okay, the tails and the fins allow them to move and swim around. At this part, at this point, you can see, yeah, their they're, fins are moving. This guy is a little active, but I've seen him move around and they actually move quite well, even though that belly sac is still attached. The mouths help to move the oxygen through their uh, gills and the gills allow them to absorb oxygen into their bodies. Pretty cool. Okay, we'll take another pass through here. You can see that guy hiding out. They've got some great hiding places in here. Well, that's pretty much it for now with Tank Time for Tom. Thanks so much for watching. Keep your eyes on the live stream. See how the Alvin are doing, and we'll see you all next week. But before I leave, we have a surprise. We're going to head over to Megan Holst, who is an animal care specialist at the Aquarium of the Bay in San Francisco, and see what interesting things she's going to show us next. Here's Megan. Hi everyone, welcome to Aquarium of the Bay. My name is Megan Holst and we're here in our nearshore tunnel. Today we're gonna to take a look at some fish anatomy. So come on up close and we're gonna look at this rockfish right here. Now the first thing that I'm gonna talk about is this pectoral fin. Now that pectoral fin has a couple of purposes. One, it's gonna to be to help them when they're sedentary, stay in place on a rock and hold still. When they're swimming, it's gonna help them steer and push themselves forward. Now up here, we have the dorsal fin. Now the dorsal fin has a spiny dorsal fin at the first part of their body, and that has a bunch of spines on that dorsal fin. Now we can take a closer look at those dorsal spines, and inside those spines has venom. Now that venom is really important for them for self-defense. And if we look further down the body, we have the soft dorsal fin, which helps them balance in the water column. Now, as that body extends back here, we have the caudal peduncle. The caudal peduncle is the very end of their body right here, and the caudal fin is what extends from the caudal peduncle. So that caudal fin is what helps them push themselves forward. They move it back and forth like a paddle to help them push their bodies forward. Now right here, underneath their body, is going to be the anal fin. Right in front of the anal fin is their vent. Now we're gonna take a look at some anatomy towards the forward of their head, or forward of their body. First we have the eye right here. We also have the nares, so come on up really close, and we can see a little hole at the very beginning of their body. And that nair is really important for them to be able to smell. So water will go through that nair and they have receptors underneath that hole that allows them to sell, smell just like our noses can work. Now water will come in, this is their mouth right here, and water will come in through the mouth and through the operculum. This is the operculum right here. Now the operculum has a couple of different really important functions. 
first is to protect the gills that are underneath that operculum that allow them to breathe. But second, as you can see here, the operculum is actually pumping water across the gills. So as water comes through the mouth, sedentary fish aren't necessarily able to push the water across the gills unless they physically push it. So that operculum is physically pushing the water across their gills. Now the last thing I'm going to talk about here is their lateral line. The lateral line is very important. You can faintly see this line that goes all the way down their body and inside that line is a line of specialized cells that have hairs in them. Now those hairs will move as things go across the animal or nearby or move near it and that when every time those hairs move it allows the animal to sense its surroundings and sense predators and prey that might be nearby. The lat lat lateral, line, lateral line is very important, especially for schooling fish, so schooling fish can stay together. So that is a quick overarching lesson on anatomy here at Aquarium of the Bay, and I hope you learned something today. That was great. Thanks, Tom, for taking such good care of our fish, and thank you, Megan, for sharing with us the fish at the Aquarium of the Bay. Now we're going to go to Derek Acom, who's a fisheries biologist for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Many of you have sent in your questions and Derek and Shelley are here to answer them. Hi everyone, it's time for Ask a Biologist. I'm Shelley and I'll be asking questions from students just like you to fisheries biologist Derek Acom. I'm really excited to read our first question from Celestine at Arroyo Seco Elementary. Celestine asks, how far can they swim? Celestine, thanks for asking how far trout can swim. Trout swim their entire lives, but they may not travel very far, whereas steelhead could migrate many thousands of kilometers to the ocean and back. Rainbow trout can swim very fast and jump very high. The reason that they can swim so fast and jump so high is that their bodies are full of muscle and they're very flexible. This flexibility comes from the fact that rainbow trout have many small delicate vertebrae. A rainbow trout has about 62 vertebrae, whereas a bass only has about 32. This extra flexibility allows them to jump over obstacles. A rainbow trout can jump a maximum of about three meters, whereas a more realistic day-to-day -day jump might be only 1.5 meters. Only 1.5 meters? That's really impressive. I'm five feet, three inches tall. So if I were standing up, one and a half meters would be about like whoo, right here. That's amazing. Thanks for that great explanation, Derek. Our last question today is from Oswaldo at Santa Rosa French American Charter School. Oswaldo asks, what is the red thing under slash on the gills? Oswaldo, bonjour. The flaps on the side of the head of a trout are called the operculum. The operculum is a bony plate that protects the gills on the trout. The red fringe that you see underneath the operculums are the gills. The red color comes from the blood near the surface of the gills. Water flows in through the fish's mouth and then out through the gills. Dissolved oxygen is extracted from the water by the gills. And carbon dioxide in the blood is forced out through the gills back into the water. Us humans, we get our oxygen by breathing in air into our lungs and our lungs are protected inside of our ribs. In a fish, they get their oxygen from the water through their gills and their gills are protected by the operculum. We began by looking at the human body, our bodies, and the special adaptations that we have for life on land that allow us to survive and thrive. We also looked at fish, in particular steelhead trout, and the things that they have that allow them to survive and thrive underwater. Now, if you hatch fish in your classroom, chances are you're hatching a rainbow trout, not a steelhead. So next week, we're going to dive deeper into looking at the differences and similarities between a rainbow trout and a steelhead trout. So I really hope you're going to come back and join us for that. I'm Ethan Rotman. I'm with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. 
wishing you a happy and healthy week. Stay distant, stay healthy, stay safe. See you then. Mm -hmm.